You're listening to the Future Tech Health Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Until I reached age 40, I never realized the obvious, that we all have medical issues, or we at least have a family member or close relation that had, has, or will have them in the future. Medicine and biological systems are the final frontier. Until we've conquered death, figured out how life began, cured cancer, and understood our purpose in the universe, there's a heck of a lot to talk about when it comes to our health. Future Tech Health means I'll be covering futuristic topics that are actually already in clinical trials or even starting to appear on shelves or by prescription or available for your own use. We dive deep into stem cells, CRISPR-Cas9, the science of sleep, epigenetics, medical testing, cancer, ketogenic diets, stem cells, aging, regenerative medicine, and more. My goal for you, the listener, is to learn from these podcasts. You may very well learn something that may change the course of your life for the better, steer you towards a new career, or give you insight into addressing a serious medical problem. Remember, however, this podcast and its content is informational in nature only. No medical, tax, legal, financial, or psychological advice is being given. If you enjoyed the podcast, please listen, subscribe, like, and share it with friends. Thank you. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Future Tech and Future Tech Health Podcast. My guest today, I've had on several times, his name is Perry Marshall. He's a longtime uh, internet marketing entrepreneur uh, turned scientist and evolutionary uh, evolutionarist, I guess if you can use that as a word. I've interviewed Perry twice, uh, not on his marketing, but on his new book, Evolution 2.0, breaking the deadlock between Darwin and design. And what Perry has done is he's taken uh, the tenets of neo-Darwinism, of the current theory of evolution uh, that's most widely held in that random mutations and natural selections are the drivers of evolution, and that life is purposeless, and it evolved from a happy chemical accident. So Perry and I discuss uh, various issues surrounding that, and why both him and I and a, a large growing body of scientists backed by evidence uh, do not believe such a thing. So I think you'll really enjoy this interview. It asks deep questions, and uh, we really have a good time. And I, I've had Perry, like I said, two other times. You can look up those interviews. And I plan to have him again because he's got quite a bit to say. So, yeah, so here's here's what I just noticed on my own I want to ask you about. So the closest thing I found that, seems to be maybe a clue to evolution is like man's breeding of dogs. So man has been able to make, you know, large and small dogs and nice tempered ones and mean ones. And, you know, they look really different. They're, they're super different, you know, like a wiener dog versus a, a big husky, right. but they're all the same species. So epigenetically, these things are different, but we haven't created a new species. And to my knowledge, we've never seen a new species come. So it made me think about, you know, how did life first of all, begin, and then how did it evolve? How did a new species come? Well, so, strictly speaking, you're right. Like, if we're just talking about dogs, dogs will always just be dogs genetically um, unless something interesting happens, okay? And the interesting thing that has to happen is you have to get a hybridization from another species that has the same number of chromosomes that actually works. And then you do get a new species. It's literal new species. Okay, so so donkey plus horse equals mule. All right? And now mules, most people know mules are usually sterile, but they are not absolutely always sterile. Everybody knows that mules are male, but they can also occasionally be female. Hmm. So once in a while, you will get a successful animal animal hybridization. All right? Now, plant hybridizations are much more common. They're literally done every day, and botanists that know what they're doing can generate a new species at will. Hmm. Okay? Hmm. Okay. The way that we um, got wheat was uh, something called emmer wheat was hybridized with goat grass about 10,000 years ago. Mm -hmm. 
and it produced the predecessor of modern wheat, okay? And then it was bred the way that we breed dogs hmm. for certain characteristics to make the kernels bigger and all of that, you know, because what a plant needs for it to proliferate isn't the same as what humans want if they want to go eat the seeds and all that, right? right? right. So humans bred it um, to, you know, and same with corn and, and everything, you know, they, they breed plants to, to, to have certain characteristics. But um, the species of modern wheat that we all know now came from a single merger of two plants. And those merger acquisitions, they're a lot like corporate merger acquisitions. They fail more often than they succeed. Hmm. But when they occasionally work well, they're totally game-changing. Okay. okay. So, so that is one way that you get a, a new species. Um, another way that you get a new species is a symbiotic merger. Okay, so there's several examples of that. Um, the, the new movie that just came out called Symbiotic Earth about Lynn Margulis is basically all about this. And it's on Amazon. You can stream it or you, you can watch it on DVD. And it's a great movie. But a symbiotic merger is when you – so there's, I've got a friend named Quan Zhang from the University of Tennessee – and he did a symbiotic merger. He put amoeba and X bacteria in a Petri dish, and they fought each other like cats and dogs for 18 months and mostly killed each other. Hmm. But at the end of 18 months, the amoeba had ingested bacteria, and the bacteria were living inside the amoebas, and it's kind of like... A Starbucks and a Marriott. So that really okay, happened? So that there was, there, this they were really fighting? Happened. Huh. This, this was in the early 2000s. There have been other examples of this, too, and, I'll, and I'll, I'll, I'll come to these. But, no, he actually did it, okay? So there's huh. a lot of historical evidence that this has happened, but it's been done in real time in the lab. And he, he did one of these things. Like, I think this guy should be like a Nobel Prize winner or some famous scientist, and he's not famous, but, but he actually did this. Now, think about what happens if you want a Starbucks inside your Marriott hotel lobby. Well, you don't just drop a Starbucks out of a helicopter through the roof, <laughs> right? Um, like, that would never work. And how would the plumbing get hooked, and how would the electricity get hooked up? Okay, well, so what the amoeba and the bacteria did because uh, they kind of have to do this, is they start negotiating who's going to do what. Huh. Because there, there has to be some benefit to the merger. Like um, maybe the bacteria generates um, energy from oxygen and then supplies it to the amoeba, and the bacteria gives the amoeba a nice, warm, safe place to live. Well, so what he found that both of these species did – was they, they cut, spliced, edited, and rearranged their own DNA until they had consolidated functions, right? Just like in a, in a corporate acting mm. position. Like, do we really need two accounting departments? Do we really need two purchasing departments? No. We're going to roll these into one. So, so this, is, this is what these things did. And the, the true definition of a symbiosis is if you if once the symbiosis is complete, you separate the two organisms, they both die. Right. And that's okay. exactly what happened with Quan Zhang's amoeba and bacteria. They had so consolidated their functions that if you separated them from each other, he'd, he'd end up with two dead cells. Well, let me ask and, you a quick question about this. So when the merger happened, was it within the lifespan of both creatures that the integration was complete? Or was there breeding at an intermediate stage of integration? No, it, it essentially happens to have happen in one lifetime in real time. It's not a gradual thing, ultimately. I mean, the negotiation and the you know some of the post cleanup operations might be, but it's essentially a, a momentary event. Okay. Huh. Okay. And, 
What? So, go go ahead, Rich. So, uh, how many? Um, what was the the incidence of this happening? Was it one in a thousand interactions, one in a million interactions? Did he have any data on that? Um, I don't know if I can give you a great answer to that question, but it, it's something along the lines of. You know, you, you put millions of amoeba and millions of bacteria in a Petri dish and you make the conditions as perfect as you know how to make them. And a year and a half later, a f um, one of or a few of them actually makes that transition. And then all of a sudden you, you really do have a new creature, a new animal. Okay, and, and this, is a, this is a pattern which if you stop and think about it, is really universal. You see it in products, you see it in literature, you see it in music, you see it in companies, and you see it in nature. It's, it's really the same thing, right? So like, well, let's take, you know, let's take American gospel and Irish folk music and we mix them together and we get country music, right? Okay, right. Or, you know, we take Cuban and the Southern music and we end up with, you know, reggae or something, right? So, so all these things, these are hy hybrids or symbiotic mergers of styles. You see this in technology, like, well, what happens if we merge um, iPhone with GPS with taxi? We get Uber. But the crazy thing is that only comes from sentient beings, meaning us, and it's very deliberate when it happens, even though it's rare. So what does that say about, you know, "Quote unquote lower organisms, bacteria and amoebas and such, doing the same thing." Well, Lynn Margulis, who popularized the theory of symbiogenesis and fought a ton of resistance in the process, she said a cell is a self, hmm. and 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 the question of being goes down to the cellular level. So anybody who owns pets knows so like I came downstairs the other day and I see the dog and the dog immediately goes and runs behind the couch and looks ashamed I'm like what did you do Hazel right she did something right did she pee on the floor did she pull the garbage out of the kitchen cabinet like what did she do she did something and she knows it right so we all know that our cat or our dog is having, you know, behind their eyes and their paws and everything, they are having an experience sort of like I am. I just think it's less self-aware and less reflective than me, but it's still an experience. Hmm. Well, you know, this might seem controversial, but let's stop and think about it. If you go to a YouTube video and you type in, uh, white blood cells chasing bacteria, you'll get a whole bunch of, and you can watch it, right? You right. can watch the white blood cells go chasing the bacteria around and go chomp on them. And in my opinion, it's no different than watching a dog chase a rabbit in your backyard. It's like the same thing. Hmm. Okay. And so when I look at a symbiotic merger uh, or, or or back to hybridization, you know, when, when you... When you merge wheat and goat grass, you know, some primitive cousin of wheat and goat grass together, and you get wheat, there's all of this meticulous engineering that has to happen as, like, the, this, you know, the sperm and the egg and everything come together. And it's like, well, this, you know, this doesn't actually match. How do we make it match? And that is what is happening. And for literally 100 plus years, biologists have just said, well, well, that's random. Well, you know, as an electrical engineer, I have a very acute awareness of randomness and what it is and what it isn't and what it does and what it doesn't do. Right. That is not random. It is highly choreographed. It's highly orchestrated. And I don't know any other way to say it other than it's the cognition and intelligence of cells that does this. Again, go watch your YouTube video right. where the white blood cells are chasing the germs around and ask yourself, like, well, how do they know what to do? Like, well, here's, do you really um, think that this is just chemicals? 
Come on. That, that's my question is why, why after 18 months did it suddenly happen? You know, I guess there's two ways that people would say, oh, well, randomly, eventually it just happened. But I don't, I, you know, I don't, I don't ascribe to that belief. So, but why else would it have happened after 18? Why didn't it happen right away? Why after that long did the amoeba and the bacteria get sick of each other and they said, all right, there's got to be a better way? <laughs> like, why then? Well, I would just go, I would just go right to my personal experience, right? Like, well, if I drop a, Mary, a Starbucks into a Marriott enough times, and if it crashes through the roof and lands in the lobby, if I, if I do that enough times, will, will the pipes accidentally get hooked up? Will the electricity accidentally get hooked up? The answer is no, it won't. This right. never happens by accident. But now think of all, I mean, we're both entrepreneurs, and we, you and I intimately know how we wrestle with these various ideas and things, mm -hmm. and we try all this stuff, and finally we find something that works. It's like, yeah, you know, the, the 10 other times I was trying to do this, I was well-intentioned, and I might have had the right idea, but this part was wrong, but that part was wrong, this partner was wrong, that vendor was wrong. And then all of a sudden you get the right thing, and it fits, right? And, and, and look, I, I think if you look at all of nature, you have competition and you have cooperation. It's going on, both of those things are going on all the time. Right. And, and so – you know, it's like, man, you know, this is getting old. Like, you know, do we have to just keep killing each other? Is there some way to work this out? And, like, you know, it's like apparently, you know, an amoeba ate a bacteria, and instead of digesting, it was like, well, how about, you know, how about I give you some energy? And uh, here, I'll give you these ETPs, and, and you uh, I'll give – you give me a safe place to live, and let's let's try to work that out. And and that apparently is what happened. But I see this as a cognitive process that, and I don't really I don't really know what to say beyond that. I mean, these are enormously sophisticated molecular machines, mm. and they're adaptive. And Barbara McClintock said, "What does a cell know about itself?" Which I think is one of the most profound questions in the history of biology. So, like, at the bottom, I don't know, but I can observe what they do. Well, did this, did this scientist see um, the beginnings of symbiogenesis and failed attempts at it? Did he see that um, sometimes the amoeba would en engulf the bacteria, but then it would slowly digest it or not digest it, and they would both die? Or, I mean, did he see intermediate attempts or failures? Um, I don't remember. I mean, his, his paper is published. Okay. Um, I, I reference it in Evolution 2.0. You could you could find the references and put it in the show notes. Right. Um, you could even interview him if you wanted to. I mean, I can I can uh, introduce you. Oh, that'd be great. Uh, I think he'd probably love to talk about it. Oh yeah. Um, but I mean, I'm 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 going to surmise that you uh, you have various intermediate levels of. You know, maybe maybe some other similar mergers that didn't work as well, or you know, maybe they died. I mean, there's this other guy named Donald Wilson who he experimented for years and years um, um, doing hybrid. I'm, I'm going to probably butcher this a little bit, but it's basically hybridizations of sea creatures like sure. starfish, um, and and he would get mixed results with these things. And sometimes he would get a hybrid, but they would all die. Um, and, uh, and he went down this huge rabbit hole where he came up with this substantially different interpretation of the entire tree of life um, than the standard zoological um, people. And, and it, it was based on hybridization. It makes perfect sense to me. Um, was it like a 3D, a 3D web of life with everything's interconnected? Well, it's it's where yes, it's much more a, a much more so. Um, it's it well okay. What it is is it's a theory of of metamorphizing animals that have larvae. Okay, so so you have a caterpillar and it turns into a butterfly. Hmm. 
his theory, which I think still has a lot of merit, he died about 15 years ago, his theory is that is that a metamorphizing animal where you have a larva and then you have an adult is life cycles of two completely different species that are living one life. Huh. So a caterpillar is born, it eats like crazy, it gets really fat, and then it spews all this stuff all over itself, goes into this cocoon, um, chrysalis, and completely dissolves, and then out comes a butterfly, and the butterfly doesn't eat the way the caterpillar did, and it flies around for a few days and it dies. Hmm. Well, Donald Wilson's theory was that it's a hybrid of two completely different species, not similar, like more different than wheat and goat grass, like hmm. very different, but just similar enough um, that they had compatible numbers of chromosomes, and then the development cycle of the embryos um, launched the instructions to build one creature first, followed by dissolving the creature mid-life and, uh, and transforming it into another. Huh. Now, biologists will tell you, well, he's wrong because that's impossible. My argument is, well, this happens in business all the time, and most of the time it fails. Okay, so like, here, here's an example. Yeah. Um, I had a client. Casey Graham uh, came to me about five years ago, and he had a company that trained pastors on how to fundraise better, get their congregations to give more, teach their congregations about money, and all of that. So it was basically what you might call a book, tape, and seminar business. I mean, that's kind of what it was, okay? Okay. Um, well an information marketing business, as marketers would say. Well, he had an app, and the app was for collecting offering money on Sunday mornings and transferring it to bank accounts. And at the, the first time I met him, the seminar and training business was a big business, and the app was this little scrungy business on the side. Hmm. I told him, I said, the app business is the real business. This other thing is just the way you pay your bills until you get the app really going. Because if you build this thing and you have a big audience, you got a bunch of churches that are using it, and you know, and all, you know, every Sunday the offering money is coming through this app. I said you'll have a business with network effect and come and buy that thing for a whole bunch of money. Hmm. Okay. Well, he that's exactly what he did, and for about three years he he used the seminar business to feed the app development and he grew the app and grew the app and grew the app. Somebody came along and bought that thing for more than $10 million. Huh. Okay. And he sold the whole thing. Now, if you think about what happened is that was a metamorphosis where the app is the butterfly that consumed the caterpillar and the caterpillar was the seminar business that would throw off cash so he could pay his developers to write code. Right. Okay. So now, if you know anything about business, you know these sorts of things fail way more often than they succeed. Right. But they are possible. In fact, they might be almost impossible, but they're not completely impossible. You can, you know, duct tape, bailing wire, chewing gum, and everything else. Like you can get it to work. Okay. The my my contention is that. All evolution is fundamentally the same. Evolution of jazz, evolution of pop music, evolution of iPods, evolution of Walkmans, evolution of video, evolution of businesses, evolution of corn, evolution of butterflies. They all follow the same overall patterns. They all obey the same principles. Hmm. And so evolution is chaos resolved by intent. And, and so you get these varying degrees of success. So I, I can totally buy Donald Wilson's theory of symbiogenesis as being the source of, of larva-based animals. And, and, of course, there's lots of bugs that work that way. There's lots of frogs that work that way. There's lots of sea creatures that work that way. That's right, the yeah. advantage of the sea, the sea creatures that Donald uh, Will, Williamson um, 
was working with. I don't. Did I say Wilson before? Yeah, you did. I yes. hope I did. It's Williamson. Williamson. Okay. Uh, Donald Williamson. Um, is that the males in the ocean? They spray their sperm all over the place after the females lay their eggs. Okay, so there's lots of opportunity for cross-species fertilization of all these creatures that are, you know, ejaculating or laying eggs. But with with people, it seems like, you know, the slightest whim or just, oh, this would be nice, is what leads to evolution of many things. But for creatures, for organisms, um, it still has to be purposeful, but it seems like there has to be a major environmental pressure to do it. You know, they don't just do it because on a whim, it seems like it, because I guess, first of all, because it oh, seems to happen I, super I rarely. Yeah. And you're guaranteed to get a major environmental pressure, whether it's a famine or an earthquake or a drought or a flood or a tsunami or an ice storm or uh, some extinction that caused by something or some food supply that gets interrupted. I mean, there's always an opportunity for a crisis. There's always a crisis somewhere. Hmm. And that's when the evolution happens. And furthermore, evolution, when it happens, usually happens fairly fast. And that's what we see in the fossil record. It's like there's nothing and then there's something, right? And there's and then it stays the same for a really long time. And then you have something new and then you have something new. It would be a great argument for creationism if it wasn't for the fact that there are people like Quan Zhang that generate these things in the lab and they actually see them. And they're hard to pull off, but they do happen. And so um, it's, it's just utterly remarkable. But I think it's, it's essentially no different than what we deal with in, in our own modern life. Like, well, you know, in 2004, you used some kind of technology, and it worked really great in your business. And then all of a sudden, somebody introduced some new kind of software. Now you're scrambling, and now you're starving, and now you're gulping for oxygen. And, you know, then you have to find something else. And usually, you're taking something not using it the way it was intended, you're co-opting it for some other uh, function, and then all of a sudden, wow, like, look, at, look what I discovered. Yeah. Hmm. Interesting. One, one thing that I read in uh, Dennis Noble's recent book, Dance to the Tune of Life, was he said that, you know, even humans will go through a single cell form, you know, the sperm or the egg. So we all literally do start out, you know, we, we have trillions of cells, but then when we reproduce, a person starts out as a single cell, you know, a single egg, single yeah. sperm. And then they build up from there. So we all go through this single cell stage, which is really interesting to me. Um, well, it is. And, and look, if, if you can go through a single cell, cell stage and that's, you know, your biggest transition, then why isn't that true of everything else? And why, why would you assume, like, if, well, if you can do something and you were a single cell, then why can't all kinds of other plants and animals do equally intelligent things? Like, I think, I think our bodies are much smarter than our brains <laughs> by far. That's a different form of intelligence, and it has a different job, but it's incredible. Um, I, I think yeah. people just take all this completely for granted. They're so used to it, they don't realize it. It doesn't just happen by itself. Well, so in addition to symbiogenesis, what are some of the other mechanisms that you think could be responsible for evolution? Well, so I mentioned hybridization. So symbiogenesis is two completely different uh, creatures mer like literally physically merging, okay? Or another version of that is lichen. Lichen is algae plus fungus, and they're living together in a very tight web, okay? Um, hybridization is when, you know, emmer weeds plus goat grass, they mate, and then their offspring is a third species that's different from the previous two, right? Okay, so that's two of them. Well, mm -hmm. then there's horizontal gene transfer, which is cells exchanging DNA, trading it back and forth. There's transposition, which is moving around genetic elements within one plant or animal. There's epigenetics, which is switching genes on and off. It's like graying out software menus, if you will, for an analogy. And there's also viruses. So viruses are always reproducing and, pu and pushing themselves into things and going all over the place. And for every 
cell in the world, there's 10 viruses floating around. So there's a lot of them. But then what happens, like viruses wreak all this havoc, but cells take virus code and they use it. Like, hey, uh, I, I can think of something I could do with this code. And they do it. And, um, and so uh, James Shapiro, who... I believe you said you're going to be interviewing soon. Mm -hmm. yep. um, he's got entire sections of his books that talk about that. There's a there's a guy named Frank Ryan who's a great writer. He wrote a book called Virolution. There's another guy you should interview. Okay. He wrote a book called Virolution, and it's a fascinating book about how viruses are a key component to evolution. There's a whole thing both. Both Frank Ryan and Jim Shapiro can tell you about how the, the, the placenta of mammals has every appearance of having being been built from virus code. Wow. Okay, I, it's really trippy. Yeah, I was going to say, there's, yeah. There's, there's incredible evidence that this is the case. Um, David Quammen. Um, talks about this in his book called A Tangled Web, which just came out, of, uh, The Tangled Tree, J just came out a few months ago. It's a great book. Mm. Um, and so, like, really, the whole notion of how evolution happens is being completely reworked right now. Like, this is not your mama's evolution or your daddy's evolution. <laughs> it is a very, very different animal than what people have been told for years. And, it's, and if you understand business, if you understand technology, if you understand music, it's all exquisitely familiar. You're like, oh, I, I've done that. I know how that works. I did that. When I was writing a poem, you know, I, I, I borrowed the, these, I took these lines from a song and then I twisted them around so it wouldn't infringe on anybody's copyright. But I, I really got inspired by that. And now, you know, look what I got in my poem here, right? This is this is how biology works. Actually, you know, going back to viruses for just a second, I just realized the immune response is the cells of our body changing themselves to adapt to a virus to prevent it from coming back. So in essence, the virus has influenced the cells of our body to change. It has changed the way yeah. that they function. Yes, absolutely. And, and um, you know, CRISPR comes from mm -hmm. the bacteria machinery that detects and chops up viruses when they enter into a cell. Like, so a virus comes knocking, and like, hey, hey, everybody, you know, you got some sandwiches in here? You know, and here, here comes a virus, and the bacteria has a database, and it's like, okay, have I ever seen one of these things before? And if it matches up to the database, it's like, oh, well, we're chopping this thing into a million pieces. That guy ain't going to eat sandwiches with us. He's going to eat us. Mm. Right. And and so um, so so bacteria have this database and what CRISPR gene editing is, is um, they they took that mechanism and they modified it to basically turn it into a find and replace function, kind of like in Microsoft Word, so that we could just edit genomes at will. Now, I think the funniest punchline in this whole thing is that for decades, the part of the bacterial genome that coded for all of this was thought to be junk DNA mm. because it had all these, quote, repetitive sequences and all this, quote, garbage that nobody knew what to do with. And so, oh, those are just leftovers from millions of years of evolutionary history, and we've got all this DNA that's junk. No, no, uh, you know. We're, we're now doing gene editing because we figured out what this thing does, right? And so the people that said it was junk, they were not doing their jobs. Like, it's never your job as a scientist to proclaim that, you know, an entire um, major part of an organism is just junk just because you don't understand what it does. And so we, we have to be really careful. And, you know, it's just uh, another example of people lacking re respect and reverence for nature and thinking that we're smarter than it is when, in fact, it's smarter than us. You should always assume that nature is smarter than you. Mm. Yeah, well, it seems to be. <laughs> so Nature always wins. So what do you, well, here's, the, here's like the, you know, I don't know, quadrillion dollar question. So how did life begin? 
what's your thoughts now, knowing all you know? Well, so I thought about this before our call, and I think there's several categories of answers that that you can bring to this. So let's let's just take them one at a time. So I was at Trinity College Dublin in September for the What Is Life um, conference hmm. a few months ago, and I met James Watson, one of the oh, guys cool. that discovered DNA. I got a picture with him. And I told him about my Evolution 2.0 prize, and he says, and by the way, this guy's like 90, 91 years old or, or something. He's really old. He goes, well, I think it's a frozen accident. I think life was a frozen accident. Now, I didn't want to sit there and argue with him, but I don't think that's a scientific answer. I, I don't I don't think that gets you anywhere. Um, it's a nice story to tell. Yeah. Um, but I, I don't I don't buy that. So I think you have two you have two categories of answer. You have intelligent causation or unintelligent causation. Okay? So let's start with unintelligent. So one one branch of the unintelligent causation is let's just call it chemistry and uh, molecular biology. And so there's all kinds of people that are they're, um, generating synthetic RNAs and things like that and seeing all the things you can do with them, and they're thinking that, well, maybe we could turn this into a cell. Um, you know, there's one, one origin of life researcher who I greatly respect. I told him, I said, you're never going to solve the genetic code problem with this approach because the code is fundamentally different than the chemicals that it's made from. Um, but any, anyway, so there's there's the chemical approach, okay? Then an, another thing that I'll, I'll just call fractals and chaos, okay? Um, I see tons of fractal patterns in life, and maybe, maybe um, there is a fractal, uh, call it an algorithm or a pattern in nature that actually generates life. Now, if, if there if there is, we don't know what it is. But, I mean, that would be a category of ways that you might look at this. Now, an another one is, is called emergent properties. Now, emergent could be confused with fractal, but it's really different. So fractal is pattern inside a pattern inside a pattern inside a pattern, okay? Mm -hmm. um, it's just repeating over and over again, and they're all over the place. An emergent property is when you get to the next level of fractal pattern, and then at that level you get something entirely different that you could have never predicted before. So, so let me give you an example of an emergent property in nature, snowflakes. Um, if, if a kid or adult never knew anything about snowflakes and they studied water and ice and vapor and all of that, they would, it would never occur to them that if, you, if water drops fall through the air, they will form these highly symmetric crystals called snowflakes, and every single one of them is unique. I got you, right. Okay? That is an emergent property. Hmm. It's when you get something at a level that didn't exist at the other previous levels. Okay, so people say life is an emergent property. Well, that could be true, but nobody knows that that's true. But... I'll just put it on the table because it's out there, okay? All right, here's, a, here's another unintelligent cause, unknown law of physics. What might it be? I don't know. But if it's out there, the Evolution Prize wants to give five million bucks to a person who can figure it out. Okay. And we want to buy the patent for it, okay? Now, here, here's another one, water. Now, there's a very, very interesting branch of research about water, Um you will find that there's, there's a lot of controversy, there's a lot of shaming, and there's a lot of uh, bickering over the as-of-yet mysterious properties of water, okay? Hmm. I have a book here called The Fourth Phase of Life by a guy named Pollock. He's got another book called Cells, Gels, and the Engines of Life, and if you go look, if you Google and you look at references, Google Scholar and stuff, you'll find there's a whole body of literature about this. Luc Montagnier, who discovered the HIV virus years and years ago, um, has done experiments that indicate that water has memory. Water has really? a bunch of character. Yeah, uh, water has a bunch of characteristics that nobody clearly understands. For example, 
if you take two beakers of water and you fill them to the brim so that the, uh, the water touches at the edge where they meet, if you put 10,000 volts on one of those beakers and you move them apart, water the water will stretch between them like a bridge for about six inches or a foot before it breaks. Nobody knows why. Huh. Water has a bunch of properties that are fraught with controversy. Um, scientists are usually taking a risk if they decide to research this because there's some stigma around this. But I think there's something here. I don't want to say any more than I actually know. I mean, I'm just giving right. you a little tidbits. But I, I think one of the keys to understanding origin of life will be a full, comprehensive understanding of properties of water that currently make most people uncomfortable and they just don't admit exist at all. Okay? Huh. All right. So, okay, so, so that's my list of intelligent, unintelligent causes. Then there's intelligent causes. Okay, so let's go through that list. God, aliens, and I, the way I wrote it down on my piece of paper is this seed of consciousness. So, so let's go through these. Um, I think, I think the, you know, the God made life argument, that's, that's pretty well known. And I think it's very plausible. Only the longer I study science, the more convinced I am that that's only a partial answer and you should never really be content with that as an immediate answer. Like, I think hmm, there are, I think there are, like, I, if anybody knows me, I totally believe in God. I'm a very spiritual person, but I think you, you damage science when you say, well, well, God did it. That's all. Like, why don't you guys just shut up and go home? I think that's a very disingenuous thing to say to a scientist. The scientist well, needs to understand. You could always say God set the top spinning and gave it all its rules and properties, and then it's, you know, from there, everything unfolded, and that's still, you know, well, the you beginning know, was him, that, but uh, the rest is, uh, is is figuring out what is, what's what been wrought, you know? Yeah, and, and my view of it is does have some resemblance to that, okay? Mm. At least some. But, but anyway, I, I don't want to dwell on that um, too, too long. Okay, so, so then there's panspermia. Um, panspermia says life was sent here from somewhere else where it, 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 it arrived on a meteor. Well, that's entirely plausible, but it doesn't really explain where that life came from. It just kicks the can down the road. <laughs> okay, right. so, like, in that sense, like, okay, maybe it's true, and, and maybe we could eventually come to the conclusion that, like, by any number of, of, of means, that, that that's actually the most plausible explanation. But it, it doesn't get to the bottom of the question. Mm. You still have the question, well, where did life come from in the first place? Right. Yeah. So where, where I want to land on this discussion is to, is to, is to just observe this. Um, you know, I, I exchanged emails with Paul Davies um, about a year and a half ago. Paul is the director of the Beyond program at Arizona State University. Paul invited me to announce the Evolution 2.0 Prize. And he has a book called From Matter to Life. It's a very scholarly book. Huh. If you want a less scholarly, more user-friendly book, uh, The Fifth Miracle by Paul Davies would be another good book to read. But basically, both of these books explain that at the core of the question of life is information. Information controls the chemicals, not the other way around. That's like one of the most basic facts of genetics. And then you get into evolution, what we've been talking about for the first 40 minutes of this conversation, you know, you have the fact that these organisms exert a great deal of control. They edit their DNA. They trade it back and forth. They discard stuff. They seem to know what they're doing with it to some extent anyway. And, and so... You, you have this whole question of how does this top-down causation in biology actually work? It's not just bottom-up. It's not just billiard balls banging around in the universe. Organisms are exercising control. Well, as an electrical engineer who's done communication systems of all different kinds, analog, digital, wrote an Ethernet book, uh, do all kinds of things with e-commerce now, own a software company, have owned other software companies that have failed. I've had successes. I've had failures. My observation is that information always comes from consciousness, mm. not the other way around. 
I think at the bottom of this whole question is the question, what is consciousness and where does it come from? And I think life is consciousness first, information second, therefore controlling the chemicals, where most of the world thinks it's chemicals first, information second, consciousness third. I think most of the scientific community has it backwards. Now, I'm not just saying this as some crackpot guy with an opinion. I'm saying this based on 35 years of electrical engineering and designing things, and I've never seen an exception to this. If anybody can show me how you get from chemicals to code, I got $5 million for you. Yeah. If, if, if anybody, I mean, the next prize we should probably come up with is how do, you, how do you get from code to consciousness? We should probably put, you know, a bunch of millions of dollars on that, too. Right. Yeah. But I don't, I've never seen it flow the other way. I've only seen it flow from consciousness downward. So that opens up a huge number of questions that we don't even have time to get into, but I think these are the questions. And it's okay to have, it's better to have questions you can't, answer than to have answers that you can't question well it seems like consciousness would have to be an emergent property of life but when is there uh when is there the start of consciousness like is a virus conscious you know have consciousness or well how about an amoeba well how about uh you know a, a small animal well how about a person well the yes then but uh when does it first emerge when does when is it an emergent property of life well that's that's one way to ask the question but another way to ask the question is, at what point does life emerge from consciousness? See, that's, that's another way of looking at it. And I think, it's, I think it's at least as valid, and it's actually more consistent with what I know from electrical engineering and software and hardware and everything else. It's more consistent with what I know than the question, how does, uh, how does life emerge from chemicals? Now, I could be wrong. I'm willing to be wrong. It's fine. I've got, a, I've, got, I've got a prize for anybody that can solve it any way that they would solve it. In some sense, I'm kind of agnostic about how they solve it. Hmm. But I do have my estimates about how it will be solved. And I think the way it will be solved is somebody will manage to wrap their fingers around what is consciousness, and they'll, and they'll start working from there. And then, I, well, I think that will be really interesting. It will probably propel us into a whole new age. So what, what's your best guess on how life began? And did it begin just once or did it begin multiple times and fail? And then at some point it got its, you know, euphemistic legs beneath it and took off. Well, when, let's work backwards. If life came from consciousness and not the other way around, it probably could have got started a whole bunch of times. Hmm. Um, but now the, the frozen accident theory is like, well, Boy, you'd never know. It's like you, it almost just dodges the question, okay? Um, if, if it's an unknown law of physics, then it could probably happen over and over and over and over again. Um, if, it's, uh, if it depends on some property of water that we don't understand and the whole earth has been full of water, like maybe, maybe it's still happening now. I mean, I don't know. Um, but, you know, I guess... I guess what's valuable about this sort of conversation is learning to question assumptions. Hmm. I mean, all of us bring so much baggage to these conversations, and we need to get rid of the baggage, and we need not to be afraid. Yeah, what's totally unhelpful and what shuts down inquiry is saying stupid things like life was a happy chemical accident or it was a frozen accident or, you know, everything's random and has no purpose. I mean, that shuts down, like, any thought as to what, where things could come from. I think that the people that say that stuff are just completely ignorant. You know? Yeah, and so, and so I think anytime you're talking about this, anytime somebody puts anything on the table, you should ask yourself a question. Does this open up the conversation, or does that shut down the conversation? Hmm. You know, the randomness thing shuts it down. The happy chemical accident, the lucky lightning strike, that, that shuts it down. Yep. We want to bring this into the realm of, what is discoverable, um, and, uh, you know, science fortunately has a wonderful self-correcting property. Maybe a, maybe a good place to end would be to talk about Jean-Baptiste Lamarck. Okay. Lamarck was from the early 1800s, about 200 years ago, the French scientist. Um, 
his, uh, a lot of Darwin's theories about evolution were inspired by him. Lamarck believed that learned characteristics were inherited by offspring. Mm. Okay, Lamarck believed that, you know, if Rich Jacobs um, eats better, exercises better, does better things, that some degree of that conditioning would be passed on to Rich's children. Right. Okay? Well, some guys in the late 80, 1800s hated that idea. They did some not very well conducted experiments. Like they literally, they would cut off mice's tails and see if their offspring had shorter tails. Okay? Yep. As though, well, that's not a learned characteristic, okay? And so Lamarck's idea got ridiculed and jeered and Basically, the guy was turned into a laughing stock and was a laughing stock literally for 150 years. Well, in the last 10 years or so, Lamarck has had a vicious comeback because of epigenetics. And we now know from epigenetics that if Rich goes to the gym, if Rich works on his attitude, if Rich doesn't drink too much, if Rich eats right, that a whole bunch of things do get passed on to your kids based on that. We also know that things like smoking and drinking and chronic family problems also have epigenetic markers and affect your children in negative ways. We know this. Lamarck was right, okay? Well, you know, when, whenever there's a group of people that is teaching you to scoff at an idea, there's probably something they don't want you to notice. Mm. And so... You know, it, it, it's really unfortunate that it took 150 years for Lamarck's ideas to be accepted because we could have just accepted them back the way Darwin did. Like Charles Darwin accepted those ideas, and then basically Darwin's evangelists who came after him just cut that out of the theory because it wasn't helping them turn it into a pop religion the way they wanted to. So, That's right, yeah. um, you know, uh, you, you just got to be really careful about these things. Um, and uh, like I said respect nature because it's smarter than we are yeah well very good perry it's been a, a great conversation and you know always a lot more to to learn from speaking to you so i encourage listeners to check out uh evolution 2.0 your book and then your podcast yes. and then um, i have a podcast called evolution 2.0 and it's up and running and uh, part of that's thanks to you you were instrumental in making that happen so yeah, uh, go go subscribe to Evolution 2.0. And, yes, thank you very much, Richard. Yeah, no problem. All right, Perry, cool. Well, yeah, I'll, I'll say that. Thanks thanks for doing this. I really appreciate it. And uh, okay, The more I study this stuff, the more questions I have. It's craziness. You know? <laughs> <laughs> they never stop, man. They never stop. <laughs> so, okay. All right, well, I'll, I'll get this you. posted soon. Take care, all right? Okay, bye. All right. You're listening to the Future Tech Health Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Until I reached age 40, I never realized the obvious, that we all have medical issues, or we at least have a family member or close relation that had, has, or will have them in the future. Medicine and biological systems are the final frontier. Until we've conquered death, figured out how life began, cured cancer, and understood our purpose in the universe, there's a heck of a lot to talk about when it comes to our health. Future Tech Health means I'll be covering futuristic topics that are actually already in clinical trials or even starting to appear on shelves or by prescription or available for your own use. We dive deep into stem cells, CRISPR-Cas9, the science of sleep, epigenetics, medical testing, cancer, ketogenic diets, stem cells, aging, regenerative medicine, and more. My goal for you, the listener, is to learn from these podcasts. You may very well learn something that may change the course of your life for the better, steer you towards a new career, or give you insight into addressing a serious medical problem. Remember, however, this podcast and its content is informational in nature only. No medical, tax, legal, financial, or psychological advice is being given. If you enjoy the podcast, please listen, subscribe, like, and share it with friends. Thank you.